A dog barks when his master is attacked. I would be a coward if I saw that God's truth is attacked and yet would remain silent. John Calvin. Get in the long tube with a bunch of demons. You really believe that human beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. <laughs> There's probably a, a balance between, I believe you have to know Christ, but... God, he's in hell. He is. And someone knows this for sure. All of mankind is going to end up somewhere in heaven. <laughs> My mission really is to just help people of faith, especially, to re-examine this issue, to realize the church has got things wrong in the past. For those who are, are gods by faith in his son... <laughs> Right? 2 Corinthians 3 7. Victory in the name which is above every name. There's no exception for rape or incest. Uh, it's an extreme law. <laughs> and... Right now, bones, ligaments, tendons, in Jesus' name, get out here right now. <laughs> so put your trust in the sovereign risen king. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to The Master's Dog, episode 55. I am your host, the Evangelical Norm, The Master's Dog. Podcast started out as Faith and Beliefs Refuted, where I was responding to the videos that Saints Unscripted, formerly known as Three Mormons, were putting out under the Faith and Beliefs uh, category uh, episodes of their show. And so it expanded uh, to deal with all kinds of false teachers. And I've, I've done videos about Paula White and Todd White and uh, Kenneth Copeland and so on. So that's when it became the master's dog. Even a, a dog barks when his master's attacked. You got the quote from John Calvin at the beginning of the, uh, the uh, intro. Um, so, yeah, that's what I do in this video is in this podcast is just dealing with false teachers. Mainly, as I do every single week, I respond to the faith and beliefs. I said when I started the podcast that I was going to respond to every one of the videos that they put out, and I have continued to do so, even on weeks where I went, eh, there's really not a whole lot to talk about. But God being who God is, he always gives uh, some kind of little some kind of theological nugget that's in there and in today's show is going to be no different um uh david is going to take us through um 1300 to 1800 or so ish in uh the mormon view of christian history is what i'm calling this uh and they're kind of he's just kind of like 50,000 foot view of what's going on. So he's going to deal with the Reformation today. We're going to let him go and talk, uh, say the things he's got to say. I'm probably not going to stop him too much as I've done in the past, because really it's it's not until the very end um, that he says anything that I actually, kind of, and it doesn't even say anything I disagree with, but there's the little insin insinuations that the LDS do. So with that, to keep you from being too confused about what I'm talking about, I'm going to go ahead and let David do what David do and um, let him tell us about how the Mormons view 
uh, church history during the time of the Reformation, 1300 to 1800 A.D. Hey guys, so in the last episode we covered Christianity in the Middle Ages, ending with the fall of Constantinople. In this episode we're going to dive into the Reformation. Ready, go. So before we talk about Martin Luther, there are a couple of people and events that really paved the way for Martin's success. One of those guys was John Wycliffe. Wycliffe went to school at Oxford, eventually became a doctor of divinity, and facilitated the first English Bible translation. But he had a bone to pick with the Catholic Church. He thought the Church had no business meddling in non-religious matters. He disagreed with the doctrine of transubstantiation and the selling of indulgences. Despite his disagreements, he died a Catholic. It wasn't until a few decades after his death that he was declared a heretic. His remains were dug up, burned, and thrown into a river. Have you no respect for the dead? Height of rudeness. Wycliffe was very influential, though, over a Bohemian reformer named Jan Hus. Hus had a significant following and shared a lot of the same beliefs as Wycliffe, which got him burned at the stake in 1415. But for most of Jan's life, the church hadn't been doing itself any favors either. So a little backstory. I believe the answers are best expressed in backstory form. Between 1309 to 1377, papal headquarters was located at Avignon, France, instead of Rome. Soon after the papacy finally returned to Rome, the pope died and the locals wanted to make sure the next pope was Italian. Urban VI was chosen, but a group of French cardinals didn't like him, so they got together and elected a new pope, Clement VII, who set up camp in Avignon. So. There were two popes at the same time, and different European countries supported the claims of different papal lines of succession. Eventually, a council got together, deposed both of the then-current rival popes, and elected a new one. Of course, neither of those two popes recognized the election as legitimate, and thus there were three popes at the same time. Three. So the schism began in 1378 and finally ended in 1417 when all three popes were forced to resign and Martin V was elected as the one and only pope. But the Western schism had irreparably damaged the reputation of the papacy and provided fertile soil for reformist ideas to flourish. Martin Luther was born in 1483 in Germany. Soon after deciding to study law, he suddenly changed his mind, became a monk, and eventually became a professor of theology in Wittenberg. Okay, I do want to stop on that note because he kind of leaves out an important uh, note here that he, he didn't just suddenly change his mind. So the, the story goes uh, that he was traveling and was caught in a, a, a terrible storm. As my daughter's uh, pop-up book about Martin Luther's life says. And, um, and so he prayed. He was caught in this storm. Fearing for his life, he prayed. He said, God, if, if you will deliver me through this storm, then I will devote my life to you. And God did. And the storm died down, as the book says. Um, and my daughter would say. And... And that was the the moment where he suddenly changed his mind. So there was a catalyst in there. It wasn't just a, a suddenly, oh, well, I think this is going to be a better path for me. There was something. There were some spiritual things that happened in Luther's life that led up to him uh, leaving the life of a lawyer, studying to be a lawyer, and becoming a monk and ultimately a teacher of of religion and uh, ultimately a reformer. So just wanted to tag that in there. In Germany, he taught some unique ideas such as salvation by faith alone, but what really put him in... Salvation by faith alone is not a unique idea. It's a biblical idea. You're saved by grace and not of works so that no man can boast. It's just that Luther started to exegete these things from the Word of God and began to teach them. It was not a unique idea. There were others who, who taught it, and it had been taught from the beginning of Christ's church. Uh, Paul <laughs> taught it, and so it's not a unique idea. It is definitely a biblical idea. Problem is, that disagrees with what the Mormons teach. So let him... Let's talk about indulgences again. 
him in the spotlight were his views on indulgences. Essentially, an indulgence was the idea that you could do certain things, such as giving money to the church, in exchange for reduced temporal punishment for your sins or the sins of deceased loved ones. People like Friar Johann Tetzel took this to a particularly manipulative level, allegedly advertising these indulgences by saying, when a penny in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. If you want to know more about indulgences, check out the notes in the description or talk to a Catholic. But like, Or you can just look at history. I mean, the the issue with indulgences was literally that they were they were selling um, uh, time off of purgatory, which purgatory in itself is not a biblical concept. So it was essentially uh, wrangling money out of fleecing the flock, if you will, just the same way that prosperity pimps uh, preachers do it today. Um, it was a fleecing of the flock. It was, and and actually, recently in uh, the last five years or so, uh, Francis, uh, I believe it was Francis, maybe it was Benedict before him, um, there was a resurgence of uh, indulgences, and I can't remember exactly what the context was, but I remember there being, maybe it was to deal when uh, um, Notre Dame caught on fire, and uh, there was something about if you donated towards that, then um, there were indulgences. But they're, they're, they're not things that hadn't actually gone away. And they are, I, I don't know if I could say blasphemous, but it's a it's heretical in its teaching. It's, it's teaching that through your financial gifting, and that was what it was, it was financial gifting, uh, you could uh, take... Um, absolution and make it quicker for those who are in a non-biblical uh, middle place between heaven and hell. Like Wycliffe, Hus, and others before him, Luther thought that selling indulgences was wrong. He wanted to hold a debate on the subject, so he wrote up his famous 95 Theses and, as the story goes, in 1517 he posted them to where most public notices would go in that time, the door of the church. Luther's views contradicted one of the most powerful organizations on the planet at this time. And the 95 Theses did cover a whole lot more than just indulgences. I mean, all the unique teachings that David mentions that, that uh, Luther taught, um, which were actually very biblical, and it's a, it's a fun thing to do. Well, I don't know if fun is the word, but it's a really informative thing to do to download the 95 Theses and, and read them to see what it is exactly that, that Martin uh, posted to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel to launch the uh, Reformation, essentially. Um, and so there were a lot there, but I mean, I don't know if indulgences was the, the main catalyst, but I know he did uh, take uh, huge offense at the issuance of indulgences, along with other things. But the printing press allowed his views to spread like the plague, but a good plague, depending on your point of view. A certain point of view? Luther was not looking to divide the church. He was looking for reform. Nonetheless, in 1519, the Pope issued a decree that Luther was teaching heresy and would be excommunicated if he refused to recant. Luther burned the decree, and in 1521, he was excommunicated and put on trial at the Diet of Worms. But things didn't go too well. No. Luther became an outlaw and went into a hiding in a castle whose name gets funnier the longer you look at it, during which time he translated the New Testament into German. With or without Luther's involvement, Protestant groups started to emerge. Then groups would splinter off of those groups and off of those groups until you find yourself in our day with thousands of options to choose from. This is where we want to stop and have a little conversation. So this is what the, as a Mormon, when I grew up in Mormon, we were taught that all of these churches completely disagreed in every sense and every uh, ounce of every little thing. And they hated each other. I kid you not. I had a teacher tell me that in Pueblo, Colorado, there's a spot where there's a Lutheran church, an Episcopal church, and a Seventh-day Adventist church. And they're 
properties are adjacent to each other uh, around a block. And um, I was told by this person, and I, I don't remember who it was that teach, was teaching, but I assure you I'm telling you what they told me was that if you left the church, the stake center early, which is where, for whatever reason, that day we were meeting at the stake center. I don't remember why, why we weren't meeting in our regular ward house in, in the third ward in Pueblo, Colorado. But we were meeting at the stake center, and he said, if you left early and drove by where these churches, when they got out, people would throw rocks at each other. They hated each other that much that they would be throwing rocks at each other from church to church. This is what I was told. This is what they want to convince you is that there's such a grand schism that they disagree. But many of these are in full agreement on the essential doctrines of the church. Salvation by grace, by faith alone, through grace alone and Christ alone. Um, that scripture is the, the ultimate authority alone for God's glory alone. The five solas, which are, you know, the kind of the core of the reformation. Many of these churches agree on those things, on what is absolutely orthodox that, you know, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that, um, the triune God, that, that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity, that God is triune, three persons, one God, one being, one nature, um, these things that, that make a church orthodox. And many of these thousands of churches agree on those essentials, and we don't have disfellowship. You know, I mean, there are Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches that, you know, I mean, just looking at the the unique relationship between Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho, Apologia Church in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and I mean, I would even say our church, Refuge Church here in Ogden, Utah, I mean, all three with 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 subtle differences in our theology and our teaching, but we all have grand community together um, where individuals of each church kind of communicate with each other. We're friends. We have, you know, connections and conferences and all kinds of things. You know, when, when Apologia had uh, reform con, we were there. Christ church was there. A lot of people from other places. So, the idea that there's grand division. Now, there are a lot of churches that have gone outside of orthodoxy um, in their belief. They, they're they not willing to follow scripture, um, you know, ordaining homosexuals, um, uh, female pastors, and so on. And I don't know if I would say, well, I would say if female pastors would put one outside of uh, biblical accuracy. And so... Again, to call it unorthodox, maybe not. Uh, heterodox, maybe. Um, but the ordination of, of homosexuals, the ignoring of, of what is sin, um, I mean, those put some of the, those churches outside of orthodoxy. And so there are those great divisions, but for the most part, many, many churches that they put out to say there's thousands and it, and it really is it comes down to style of worship style of baptism style you know whether it's pedo baptism credo baptism sprinkling dunking whatever these things the way we uh administer communion intinction or elder uh administered or um self-administered or all these things there are so many different things in um you know that that separate these churches but there's st it's not that there's a huge separation because orthodoxy still holds us all together in um and so it really it's it kind of gives just a a place where someone might be um more comfortable and so to to insinuate which i'm not saying david did this fully in this video but what Mormon teachings quite often insinuate is that these churches are just constantly at heads with each other and you're wrong and you're wrong and you're wrong. And while there are debate on secondary issues and, and you can see grand examples of civil debate between brothers in Christ disagreeing on secondary issues, James White and Mike Brown, um, Michael, Michael Brown, and he goes by Michael, uh, you know, uh, 
and Todd Todd Friel and you know who Todd doesn't do a whole lot of debate. Um, Todd debates more atheists than anything else, but you will see um, friendly uh, debate over small secondary issues come up between different groups. So that was that's the the big thing that I really wanted to talk about was the idea that. Um, somehow this grand number of denominations within Christianity somehow proves that Christianity is false, and it really doesn't. But that's what Mormons will use to try to convince people of uh, the validity of the Mormon church over um, the truth and orthodoxy of mainstream Christianity. But of particular note is the year 1534. The Pope wouldn't let the English King Henry VIII get a divorce, so Henry broke away from the Pope, formed the Church of England, put himself in charge, and got his divorce anyway. Isn't that cheating? Over time, some people believed the Church of England had strayed from true Christianity and needed to be purified. These people came to be known as Puritans. In the 1700s, as Catholics and Protestants clashed in Europe fighting the Thirty Years' War, tens of thousands of Puritans settled in the New World, establishing 13 colonies. In 1776, those colonies declared independence from England, marking the start of the Revolutionary War. Now, this is a Latter-day Saint channel, so I'm bringing it back around full circle. One of All right, before he does that, let's address the, the whole Church of England thing. Now... The Protestant Reformation broke off from Catholicism because of what they saw in the Bible not being practiced in the Catholic Church and the desire to see it reformed. And when, when it was obvious that the, the Catholic Church was not going to reform because of their pride of not wanting to say they were wrong or power or whatever, the, the Protestant Reformation caused a, a split and then what he talked about, the creation of, of denominations in Protestantism. The Church of England is a different thing. This is literally one man going, I don't like this, and so I'm going to go make my own thing. It wasn't based on a biblical thing. It wasn't based on anything. It was just based on the fact that he did. he wanted a divorce from his wife, and so he created his own religion that allowed it. Um, yeah, there's a there's a difference between a selfish creation of a new religion and biblical reform of a uh, of a straying from orthodoxy religion, if that makes any sense. And so the Puritans again would kind of be the equivalent, the Church of England equivalent to um, the Protestant Reformation. They were like, look. You took this and you did this and in, in in for a selfish reason, but we want to bring this back to biblical truth. And that's what the Puritans were about, where they were like, well, let's look at the Bible and go, yeah, divorce is wrong. Because the Puritans would believe that, that divorce was wrong. Um, and so the desire to take what had... Be, what was split off for selfish reason and and return that to orthodoxy so there there's a little bit that i just wanted to kind of discuss on that point um just to kind of give an idea of why it's not really similar to what um the protestant reformation was and i think it would actually be if you look at the reality of what Joseph Smith did, the creation of Mormonism was very much like uh, the creation of the Church of England. Joseph didn't like a lot of the things that was being taught in Presbyterianism and Methodism and, and Baptist churches and so on in his area. Obviously, they were looking and seeking, and he was intent on putting his own spin on these things. And you can see as... LDS history progressed and Joseph Smith's theology changed that that power and that selfishness just like Henry whoever the eighth or whatever um, he kept changing the church and so uh, when 
you know, a, a Baptist uh, preacher told his mom that the baby that died at, in childbirth or very young, it was it Alvin um, Smith, was not in heaven because he wasn't baptized. Joseph was like, well, you know what? We have baptism for the dead. And so we see that same kind of issue of one man with the, the ability to change and uh, devise his own religion, which is what Henry did, which is what Joseph did, and which is completely different than what the reformers did when they were going back and going, what you're teaching is not biblical. We want to see it changed. And when that church refused to change it, then there was the split. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense to you. I'll let him mention uh, Solomon Mack and, and the birth of Joseph, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. One of those men who fought in the Revolutionary War was named Solomon Mack. After the war, Solomon bought farmland in Vermont and rented it out to his son-in-law. It was on this farm that Solomon's grandson was born in 1805, Joseph Smith Jr. Now, there's a lot of great stuff I skipped over in this episode, so check out the links and notes in the description to fill in some of the blanks, and have a great day. All right, so there you go. Um from Constantinople to the birth of Joseph Smith, because that's church history right there, right? So hopefully uh, the, the explanation of denominations and so on was helpful. Um, you know, I'm, I'm open to other questions or anything like that. But again, to see how Mormons try to, to take the denominations to use to prove um, the validity of Mormonism, you can really look back and go, well, there's still a whole lot wrong. You know, we've got, yeah, you've got all these different uh, denominations and, and sects of Christi uh, mainstream Christianity, but it does not make up for the fact that, that Mormonism is really just a, a man-made, uh, man-glorifying, uh, non-biblical religion that continued to change as Joseph changed and continued to change after that. Um, even to today, there are still changes that happen in the LDS Church. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, I've, I've predicted, within 10 years, there will be ordaining women and homosexuals in the LDS Church. And that's my prediction. We'll see if I'm right. Uh, you know, May 25th, 2020, mark the tape. We'll see if that comes to pass or if I'm just another uh, Harold Camping, right? So, um uh, hope again, hopefully this was helpful to you guys. As always, preach the gospel at all times. Use words, they're necessary. And until next week, Soli Deo Gloria. Mm -hmm.